Good morning, everybody. We have now a lecture on the economics of legal tender laws. This is a very sexy title. I'm always amazed that people show up for this lecture at all, right? Whatever. The, the operation of a, of a, whatever, a diesel motor or something could not be more attractive. <laughs> well, this, the, the, the point of the lecture is to explain how legal t- tender laws impact the evolution of monetary systems, the historical transformations that we observe from about the 16th century into our own day. If you look at any textbook on the economics of money, money and banking, you will find usually very short chapters on the subject, and so you get a very condensed uh, statement of what you find in more extensive treatments of the question in monetary history. The bottom line is that the main institutional transformations that we have observed have resulted from the greater efficiency of the new institutions. So up to the 16th century, our monetary systems were essentially based on metallic coins, coins made out of precious metals, silver in particular, and also uh, to some extent gold, also to some extent copper coins, and uh, mixtures of this, with all alloys. Banking was weak, respectively did not exist at all, commercial banking in the sense in which we know it today did not exist at all. There was credit, credit played a huge role, commercial credit, it's very important, also in, in ancient times already, but banks did not exist. Then we observe, starting in the 17th century, a systematic growth of commercial banking in the modern sense, that is banks that act in two functions as intermediaries of credit, financial intermediation, and banks acting as producers of money substitutes. And then starting in the 18th century, at first week, then growing throughout the 19th century and coming into full swing in the 20th century, we see the victorious march of immaterial base money. Paper money at first, and in our day, of course, especially electronic money created by central banks. Now, why is this so? Why did the economy operate for 16th century, after Christ and before, it was the same thing, essentially on a metallic base with not much banking at all, Why did it come to these transitions, to money-producing banks, and finally into immaterial money? And the answer that we get in most textbooks today states that, well, these new institutions are more efficient than the old ones. It's because fractional reserve banks are more efficient, as both as intermediaries and as money producers, that... We have abandoned the old metal-based monetary systems and have made a transition toward bank money production. And it's again because immaterial money is more efficient than metallic money that we have made, they've completely abandoned silver and gold as base monies of the economy and adopted first paper money and today a mixture between paper money and electronic money. So the point of my lecture is to question this orthodox doctrine and to explain that the transition that we have observed and which I have described has essentially resulted from fiscal motives of the governments that changed the institutional environment, the legal environment under which the economy operated, and that legal tender laws have played a major role in this transition. Readings on this subject would be, well, my book, uh, The Ethics of Money Production, in which I quote the relevant literature on the subject. There's one uh, paper that I might single out. It's always a pleasure 
single out works by people with whom you agree, disagree on certain questions. So there's George uh, Selgin and Lawrence White, with whom I do not agree on everything, uh, have published an excellent paper on, uh, uh, with the title, the, A Fiscal Theory of Monetary Interventionism, that appeared in 1999 in Economic Inquiry. So it was a very good paper. It's, it's not ultimately original, but they stated the, the thesis that is, uh, let's say, uh, conventional among Austrian economists and has been conventional among classical economists in terms that were understandable for present-day neoclassical economists. So in my lecture, I will first uh, deal with uh, legal tender laws in metallic monetary systems, then turn to legal tender laws under fractional reserve banking, and finally to legal tender laws in the case of immaterial fiat money. As far as legal tender laws in metallic monetary systems are concerned, we'll first deal with uh, such metallic systems in which we have only one type of coins, so that the, the only problem is the transition from old to new coins. Then we'll uh, deal with coin systems, and then state the, the problems that we confront here. So if we have only one type of coins, and that has been historically the practice in, in Western Europe for about 300, 400 years, and we had a major currency reform under uh, Charles the Great in the, in the 8th uh, century, even before he became emperor in 800, uh, which created a monetary system based on three coins. One was the most, the smallest one was the penny, then we had the shilling, and we had the pound. And so one pound equal to 20 shillings equal to 240 pennies. Now the pound and the shilling were never minted. They were only accounting units. The first shilling, the first shillings were, were minted in the 12th, 13th century, and it never came to minting a pound because it would have been a very voluminous, it would have been a one silver pound approximately a coin, so it's not really practical to do this. Uh, pounds were minted when uh, much later, starting in the uh, 15th, 16th century, we created coin systems co consisting of silver coins and gold coins, so then we could use a gold coin as a pound. So at the beginning, we just had one coin that was used at all, namely the penny. So the pennies were then worn out because, well, okay, mix in some, some, some alloy, but still they, they're being used in the exchanges, so you need to substitute always some new coins for them. Now the uh, minting was very primitive uh, in those days. We didn't have machines, we didn't have steam machines. The steam machines that George uh, Selden talks about in his, in his nice book on sound money, and all this came much later in the 16th century, and then the, the great steam machines, which made these very fine and precise coins, came in the 18th century. So at the beginning, what uh, uh, coin makers would do was would just take one pound of, of silver and uh, make coins out of them, 240 coins with some alloy, and they were quite unequal. Okay, it's more than completely unequal, but the, the margins of deviation were quite large. And so typically a coin would weigh, what, about 3.5 grams. But the deviations were large, so it went from 3.8 to 2.9 or something like this. So it's quite considerable. The only verification consisted in taking the entire amount of 240 coins that has resulted from your batch, putting them on the, on the, on the balance, and verify whether you had reached one pound plus the, uh, the weight of the alloy. So it's a very imperfect means of doing this. Now, so if you have coins of, of uh, different um, weight, um, you cannot, in the exchanges, simply substitute one for the other. So strictly speaking, you would have to have different prices according to the true weight of the coin. And you would have to pay different prices in good coins, lower prices in, in good coins, and somewhat higher prices in in, in bad coins. Similarly, if you remake the coins, so you have a new batch of coins, they're in better shape than the old ones. Typically, these coins are better, so you would have to pay lower prices in terms of these coins 
and higher prices in terms of the older coins. That's how it would operate on a free market. Now, uh, what the emperors did at the time, and what they have keeping doing, was to impose legal tender laws on these coins. That is, the law stipulated that all coins were being were, had to be treated as being equal, equal before the law. Each coin was supposed to be of equivalent value as all other coins, so you could not pay a higher price in terms of bad coins and a lower price in terms of good coins. And this creates a phenomenon that we call Gresham's Law. Gresham's Law says that bad money drives good money out of circulation in a regime of monetary interventionism, in a regime of price controls. It's this latter part that is often not stated in the textbooks. Most textbooks are pretty good today on on Gresham's Law, but you still find this from time to time. uh, Gresham's Law is announced merely as saying that bad money drives good money out of circulation, as though it were a general law of the economy. We cannot have monetary competition because money is somehow exceptional. Here, different, distinct contrast to all other fields, the bad product is being preferred by the users, by the consumers, to the worst product. So as in all other fields, we prefer better cars to worse cars and better suits to worse suits, better microphones to worse microphones. In the case of money, it's somehow we are all perverse things, right? <laughs> we prefer bad coins to good coins. Now that is, of course, not true. And it's not true because in a free market system, coins would be evaluated according to their uh, true metallic content, and so good coins would tend to be preferred and because uh, they allow us to, to pay with lower prices and so on. We have greater confidence in good coins. If we have legal tender laws, if the law makes good coins equal to bad coins, then, of course, we have an incentive to pay only with bad coins and to keep the good coins for ourselves. I have to make a payment. I sold my, well, anyway, I bought a car. I bought a car. I get the car now. The seller tells me, you can pay tomorrow. You owe me 100 pieces of silver. So, all silver pieces are supposed to be equal. So I go home, I have my 150 pieces of silver, and then I look, nya, 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 nya. Which are, <laughs> which are the best ones? I keep them for myself. Right? That's, of course, I would maybe not do this because I'm a very nice guy and so on. <laughs> <laughs> right? But the incentive is there. Right? The incentive is there to keep the good coins, the coins that are heavier, that have more metal in them, for yourself and pay with the bad coins. And because everybody does this, the tendency is therefore for the bad coins to remain in circulation, to be shifted forward, and for the good coins to be hoarded uh, for, for some bad times in the future. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the, the reason why we uh, have a somewhat distorted view of monetary history. We, in, in historical studies, we tend to underestimate the extent of the distortion of the, of the coinage, because what we know about past coins results essentially from money hoards that we find from time to time in the, in the ground. I don't know whether you have followed the news about a month ago or so, some British uh, citizen, an Englishman, he found 52,000 coins about one yard under the ground in, I don't know, in East Anglia, I believe. So these were Roman coins. The question is, why were there one yard under the ground? In a rural area, right? In a city area, of course, you, you build on this, right? And or the, the ruins are down, down there. But why was this in a rural area? Well, clearly it was somebody who was hiding uh, his coins from tax authorities and, and other evil persons. <laughs> so keeping his good coins in the ground and using the bad coins to make transactions. That's why we learn, that's how we learn about monetary history. From time to time we find these money hoards. 
So Gresham's law holds only, it's, it's, it's not a general law of, of, the, of the market economy, it is a law of monetary interventionism. That's a very, it's a very important point. It is called uh, Gresham's Law after Sir Thomas Gresham, who was the financial agent of Her Majesty, the Queen of England, at the end of the 16th century, in the largest capital market of Europe, which was the largest capital market of the world at the time. Does anybody happen to know where this capital market was? Which city? It was not Amsterdam. Antwerp, that's correct. Who said Antwerp? Antwerp? Very good. Yeah. Very, very good. Yeah. So, uh, the biggest capital markets were in those days, and what later became the, well, in those days had just become the Netherlands. Amsterdam rose to prominence in the 17th century, so in the last, uh, second half of the 16th century, it was Antwerp. So, Thomas Gresham was writing uh, monthly reports, was not an investment letter, but monthly report to his queen, and in one of them describing this phenomenon. But the phenomenon had been known already before. It had been described already in, tic- in antiquity. There's a famous uh, poem by Aristophanes, The Frogs, in which he describes the same phenom- phenomenon. And uh, also in the Middle Ages, uh, Nicholas Oresmi, uh, most important monetary theorist of the 13th century, of, of the 15th century, excuse me, excuse me the 14th century. So 13th of the 15th, the 14th century. <laughs> I'm sorry published his book on, uh, on money around 1365, he described this phenomenon as well. So what are the problems? Well, and of course you have the same problem also if you have coin systems. That is, if there's not a transition between old coins and new coins, but if you uh, make uh, coins out of different metals and you impose... Uh, fiat exchange rate among them. If there's a market exchange rate between gold and silver coins of 1 to 60, and the government imposes an exchange rate of 1 to 40, then this means, uh, so one unit of gold being exchanged on the market for 60 units of silver, weight units of silver, and the government imposes one weight unit of gold has to be exchanged for 40 weight units of silver, then silver is being overvalued as compared to gold, and gold is being undervalued as compared to silver. So gold is here the good money, silver is the bad money. So in this case, silver drives or would drive gold out of circulation. People would hold back, hoard their gold coins, and they would only use the silver coins. Now, uh, this uh, seems to be an unwelcome consequence. So the question is, why did governments do this? Why did they impose such laws? There were various, certainly various reasons. One might have been the concern to facilitate exchanges because if people have to put each single coin on the balance in order to determine what is its true metallic weight, then things get a little bit more complicated. So this was, was one thing. Okay. But there was also a more... Uh, selfish motivation and which was to replenish the public purse or more precisely to pay back debt owed by the government with less money than was really owed. So for example the government could do the following it owed whatever, one billion pounds to its debtors or the government could come and say, well, we issue new coins that have the same name as the old coins, but which contain only half of the metal. So that rather than paying one million pounds in silver, the government now pays back half a million pounds in silver, but the half a million pounds in silver is called one million pound. And it's legally the same thing as the one million pounds in old coins. So this is typically what had been done. So the government expropriates its creditors, it enriches itself at the expense of those creditors by issuing new coins that are lighter than the old coins, but which have a legal tender privilege, that is, that have to be accepted 
on the same footing as the old coins. And that's, of course, a very strong incentive for all market participants who realize what is going on to hoard the old coins and to use only the new coins. In my example, we have a very dramatic debasement of the coin. That's how, it called, how it's called. Right? You have to reduce the metallic content. It's the debasement of the coin. 50% at one stroke is rather exceptional. And usually it went in smaller doses, but you could reach this dimension after some time, after a few years, because it was not unusual that every single year the coinage was reformed, so new coins were being issued, always with a lighter weight. And usually, when the fiscal situation deteriorated, then this would follow an exponential path. So in the Roman Republic, for example, debasement was relatively moderate in the first century, was still relatively moderate in the second century, and it took fully off in the third century. So by the end of the second century, the coins still contained about 50% of their previous weight in silver. And then at the end of the third century, they were reduced to 2%. And so you had a very dramatic uh, decrease. Now, what are the problems resulting from this? Okay, so you get uh, a perversion of the currency. The monetary products that are being used are inferior to the ones that could be used, that would have been used on the market. That doesn't seem to be of much concern to the government. After all, what role could it play, whether you pay with bad coins or with good coins? Well, you pay, at least you pay. There were problems that were, uh, that did concern not only well, the efficient operation of the market economy, but had a direct impact on the self-interest government finance or self-interest of the government itself. One important, and this is the central negative consequence that results from uh, legal tender laws and Gresham's law, is that you get a fiat deflation. There's an artificially strong reduction of the money supply. If you impose new coins of lighter weight, and these coins are supposed to be treated on equal footing with the old coins, so everybody hoards the old coins and only the new coins are being used, then the money supply shrinks. The amount of money that's actually being exchanged, offered in exchange on the market, shrinks quite dramatically. And this is all the more so as it takes time to produce the new money. How did this operate technically? If you change the coinage of the country, the king issues an order to all citizens, you bring your old coins to the mint. So this is the, the place where the, the coins were then transformed, right? You bring whatever, one pound of silver in terms of old coins to the mint, and the minter would then turn them, remint them into new coins. Of course, if the new coins were of lighter weight, you bring one pound of true silver, you get half a pound back, which has the same legal value. So people then, of course, had this incentive to say, well, actually, I don't have, I, I happen not to have any old coins. <laughs> right, so, or just these few, right, and you brought them to the mint. But in any case, this process takes time. The hoarding occurs immediately, and it takes time until the new coins enter circulation. So you get a fiat deflation, a deflation that does not result from the market process, but results from government interventionism. And fiat deflation can be very problematic, as we have seen already during the week, that the price level per se doesn't play uh, any essential role for the operation of a market economy. But if you have an economy in which price controls are ubiquitous, uh, so there are minimum uh, prices for agricultural products and so on, so you cannot legally sell the products and you cannot legally sell labor and so on at lower prices than before, then of course you get major disruptions of economic activity. And this is therefore one explanation of why things did not really take off in the Middle Ages. So the legal tender laws create 
consequences that are unwelcome, not only from an aggregate point of view, but in particular from the egoistic point of view of the government itself. And this, ladies and gentlemen, created incentives to look out for some other way of attaining the same end, replenishing the public purse through monetary interventionism. And the solution that was found was fractional reserve banking. So let's first look at how fractional reserve banking operates without legal tender laws. Fractional reserve banks create money substitutes. Money substitutes are being used as money. That's why they're called a substitute. They use them on the same footing as base money in daily exchanges. Now, fractional reserve banks can increase these money substitutes out of nothing, right? So they are called fiduciary media. They're only partially backed by base money. Now, this increase of the money supply differs with the increase, the nominal increase of the money supply that we have seen in debasement. In the case of debasement, it is done through the creation of new coins, but which are physically different from the old coins. So could be distinguished, therefore, it was possible for people to hoard the good coins and to use only the bad coins. In the case of fractional reserve banking, if the fractional reserve bank issues more tickets, the new tickets are physically indistinguishable from the old ones. Even if the bank had operated before on a 100% basis, and now it issues tickets in excess of its reserves, so it turns into a fractional reserve bank, you cannot see it from the tickets. You don't see it at the banknote. This banknote is somehow physically inferior or lighter than the previous one doesn't make sense, right? It's all the same. So you don't get precisely that consequence which is so unwelcome in the case of debasement. You don't get a reduction of the money supply. You don't get that fiat deflation, which disrupts economic activity and therefore uh, diminishes also the tax base of the government. And that's the reason why fractional reserve banking has been very attractive from the point of view of government finance. And we find here the reason why, starting in the 17th century, governments have encouraged fractional reserve banks on a systematic basis. They have encouraged them by doing business with them. With fractional reserve banks that were established privately and by, well, chartering specially privileged fractional reserve banks, such as the Bank of England, or sometimes establishing fractional reserve banks in the name of the state. Char the most famous chartered fractional reserve bank was the Bank of England, is still with us. And its, mission, its initial mission was to provide a credit of 1.2 million pounds to the British crown. Excuse me, English crown at the time, because Great Britain did not yet exist. The English crown. 1.2 million pounds it seems to be ridiculous today, but keep in mind that, of course, the purchasing power was way higher, so we are talking here about billions, if not trillions, in terms of current day uh, purchasing power. It was a huge credit. And this was possible only because of the fractional reserve principle. So the fiscal mission was there from the beginning. Uh, other governments created banks in their own names. So it was the Bank of Prussia, for example, which had the same function, which eventually turned into the, uh, the Reichsbank and today into the Bundesbank. So how do fractional reserve banks operate without legal tender laws? How do they operate with legal tender laws? Fractional reserve banks, even if they do not benefit from legal tender laws, well, suffer from the problem of virtual illiquidity. It is impossible, by definition for the bank, to redeem all of its tickets if presented at the same time for redemption. Right? That's the principle of fractional reserves. If everybody comes and presents the banknotes to the bank, the bank cannot possibly redeem all of them at once. Now, this if one bank goes bankrupt, this has negative repercussions on the other banks. 
the other banks will be in liquidity problems too, especially if they are operating with low reserves, if they, if they are strongly leveraged, as we would say today. Why is this so? Because if one bank goes bankrupt, then the money supply shrinks, so we get problems on the revenue side for various companies operating in the economy. These company, some of these companies will not be able to repay the debt that they owe to other banks, so these banks will then have liquidity problems. Right? So the failure of one bank tends to spread to other banks. Liquidity problems, liquidity defaults in one bank tend to entail liquidity defaults in other banks. Now, the thing is that everybody knows this. All banks, well, at least maybe not initially on theoretical grounds, but by experience, bankers come to know this. So bankers have, therefore, an incentive to help out other bankers. There is a spontaneous solidarity between all fractional reserve banks. It's a very peculiar characteristic of this industry. You don't find it anywhere else. If one shoe producer goes bankrupt, uh, it's not that the other, other his competitors are in tears. Right? They, ha, 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 ha. Uh, there's a market share, right, to be grasped, so they're happy. If one banker goes bankrupt, then his colleagues, competitors, grow very nervous. What will happen now with me? Right? So they have an incentive to help out if there's any risk that this fire will spread to them. And therefore, we have a strong incentive for cartelization in the bank industry. This is what we have observed uh, historically in all cases in which there has been any significant bank industry. There was a virtual cartelization, spontaneous solidarity between them. Now, this uh, solidarity, this cooperation that installs itself among fractional reserve bankers seems to be beneficial at first sight, but of course, ultimately it is not because it creates perverse incentives for all those who are in the cartel. If I, as a banker, I know that if I go bankrupt, this will have negative repercussions on my competitors, they therefore have an incentive to help me out right now, I'm relaxed. I say, okay. Right. So my true reserves are not only the reserves that I hold in my own vault. My true reserves are my own plus the reserves of all the other guys. And right. so we get a virtual pooling of all reserve money. Everybody starts behaving as if he could rely not only on his own reserves, but also on the reserves of the others. The consequence is that bankers have an incentive to issue even more, that is to reduce the reserve ratio even further. And as a consequence, of course, the system as a, as a whole becomes even more fragile. So cooperation between banks is at best a temporary solution to the problem of illi virtual illiquidity of banks. It creates moral hazard problems that ultimately entail even greater expansion of the money supply, and therefore even greater fragility of the fractional reserve banks. Sooner or later, therefore, the entire system is likely to collapse right? if at this very low reserve ratio there's the slightest problem within some bank, then immediately cannot be helped anymore, and uh, the failure of one bank then entails very quickly the failure of the entire banking industry. So this is the perfect storm. And this perfect storm has happened regularly throughout the 19th century. And that's what we, this is banking history in the 19th century. Banking industry comes into full swing, bankers cooperate, everything is fine, and every 10 years or so, there's a major banking crisis. Because exactly that, what I've just described, happens. And this, of course, creates um, a strong incentive for banks to look for other solutions, it also creates an incentive for the government to look for solutions to this problem. Because the government is among those who stand in line to uh, be negatively affected by a banking crisis. If you have a banking crisis, then credit dries up. So for the next two years or so, you don't 
get any more credits to finance your wars or your welfare systems and so on. So we have a problem here, we have a fiscal problem. What was the solution on which uh, we fell then, or that was developed then? Well, the, the solution was a concentration of the banking system, the pooling of reserves. And the pooling of reserves uh, occurred through the development of central banks. The first central, major central bank was the Bank of England. Another solution, well, okay, before we come to this other solution, which are legal tender laws, let's discuss the, the impact of the institutional solution of concentration. Does the concentration really help or solve the problem? The answer is it does not. It is, again, a temporary solution, just as the initial cooperation between fractional reserve banks is a temporary solution, but is ultimately reversed because of the moral hazard problem that it creates. So the introduction of central banks does not really solve the problem, but creates an even greater moral hazard than before, so that fractional reserve banks even further increase their issues. Banks that know that they can rely on a central bank have a perverse incentive to increase their issues rather than remain on the same level as before. So just as the cooperation with their competitors previously has created this incentive, the incentive has become even stronger. It was a constant complaint of the Bank of England in the 19th century that whereas itself uh, was relative, behaving relatively moderately, so they were operating, whatever, on a, on a reserve ratio of, uh, of, of 10% or 20%, all the other banks were much more audaciously uh, going... Uh, using the leverage. Uh, that is, uh, they had, were having lower reserve ratios than the Bank of England. So sooner or later, this system is likely to collapse as well. In the case of the, uh, the English monetary system, we had a couple of uh, banking crises after the introduction of the Bank of England. And the Bank of England itself survived only thanks to the cooperation of banks that had a very high reserve ratio was notably the Banque de France. Uh, the Bank, uh, Bank of France uh, was operating at 80 or 90 percent of reserves. Uh, it was uh, almost a money warehouse, and it could help out other fractional reserve banks in times of trouble. And the French did this, among other things, because they were negotiating political favors in exchange for such financial assistance. So how are these things modified once legal tender laws come into play. Legal tender laws might be an additional tool to keep the banking system going. If we grant legal tender privileges to the issue of a bank, then the demand for these issues is artificially stimulated. The bank knows that everybody else has to accept these, these notes. All bank customers know that all other market participants have to accept these notes. So, whereas before, in some cases, they would say, well, I would rather go for, for base money, would rather take some silver coins or gold coins, because uh, Bank of England notes might be too hot. Now they would take Bank of England notes with a legal tender status, because they know that everybody else has to accept them. And so they can definitely use them in exchange. And once you have them, you can bring them back to the bank. But the incentive is not very strong because you know that all the other guys still have to accept them. So legal tender laws create, in this case, an artificial increase of the demand for legal, uh, for fractional reserve banknotes and for fractional reserve uh, demand deposits, and therefore the expansionary potential of the whole banking system increases. And this is exactly what we have observed. But legal tender laws do not finally solve the problems of virtual illiquidity of the banking system. What they do is to create much greater leverage than would have existed without the legal tender laws. And there's again the moral hazard issue, so people issue much more, many more tickets, but the system as a whole becomes more fragile. So at some point then the slightest accident is sufficient to make it impossible for the central bank to still continue redeeming its notes. Right? People still have the right to redeem 
legal tender notes at the bank into gold or silver. But if the reserve is very, very low, if it's just 3%, as historically in the case of England in the second half of the 19th century, 3%, right, it doesn't take much to get such a system to the brink of default, the system as a whole. Now the question is, what happens then? Either the entire banking industry collapses, one solution. The other solution, and this is of course a very unwelcome solution from the point of view of the government. Because who is the main customer of all these banks? Well, it's again the government, historically. And even today, things have not fundamentally changed. If you look at financial markets, right? you have the two big compartments of uh, stock markets and you have uh, uh, bond markets, right? And half of the bond market, typically, is government. Both both segments are about the same, right? The bond markets are bigger than the stock markets, right? Slightly bigger than the stock markets. And half of the bond markets, typically, in most on average, right, is government bonds. And in some countries, it's only government bonds, right? In Russia, it's only government bonds. So governments have a very strong incentive and keep the show going. So what did they do? They authorized a suspension of payments. Central banks were allowed to deny redemption of their notes. Even though it was written on the note, I promise to redeem, promise to pay for the, in exchange for this note, the sum of 10 pounds. And they no longer had to do it. So the, the law introduces then a double standard. On the one hand, the bank may still claim payments that are due to herself, but she does not have to comply with her obligation, contractual obligation, to pay people who have deposited money with her. And so that's the meaning of the law, morally very offensive. But in any case, so the point is that through such laws, we introduce at one stroke an immaterial base money. The notes of the bank, of the central bank, which before have been money substitutes, are turned into base money because the legal tender law still holds. The notes can no longer be redeemed, but they have to be accepted by everybody. So before there were money substitutes, the very same physical object now turns into an object that from the point of view of law and of economics is fundamentally different. It's the base money. So we have a new reality that is of utmost significance because the producer of an immaterial base money cannot go bankrupt as long as all of its debt is denominated in terms of its own money. If you look at the balance sheet of a central bank, the Bank of England or the Federal Reserve, you see a lot of debt. There's virtually no equity. There's even less than 1% equity. A lot of debt. What does this mean? Does it mean that the bank can go bankrupt? It cannot, because the bank has a printing press, and it has the possibility to create demand deposits denominated in dollars out of nothing, to be redeemed exclusively in nothing else but like demand deposits and like paper notes issued by the bank herself. So a central bank cannot go bankrupt. And therefore all those who benefit from the unmitigated loyalty of a central bank cannot go bankrupt. Now this explains, ladies and gentlemen, why we have a very strong increase of, of public debt especially after the introduction of paper money, of immaterial fiat money, which happened the last time in 1971, when the system of Bretton Woods ended. The system of Bretton Woods was still based on gold. Gold was the base money. So dollar notes were money substitutes. It was still the problem of redemption. So the bank could not issue too many notes. That is, of course, they finally issued too much. Therefore, they had to suspend payments. But ever since, of course, money production has increased much more than that, and debt has grown exponentially. Debt has grown exponentially, public debt in particular, 
because market participants realize, investors realize, that no government, no major government, can go bankrupt. As long as the Feds benefit from the assistance of the Federal Reserve, as long as the Federal Reserve will buy any amount of U.S. Treasury bonds, U.S. Treasury bills, they cannot go bankrupt. So, you grant ever more, as much credit to the Federal Reserve, or excuse me, to the Federal Government, as the Federal Government would like to have. So that has grown exponentially. Now, does this mean that uh, the, the problems now have been solved? We just have a lot of debt. Is this all that there is to it? Uh, Austrian uh, economics explains to us that this is not the case, that there are still limitations. Right? We still have, for example, the fundamental moral hazard problem, right? which, in fact, has been even increased. The market participants know now that, that there is a major institute, that there are other central banks that can produce unlimited amount of, amounts of money and are therefore able to bail out virtually all companies that exist. So there is a perverse incentive not only for other banks, but ultimately also for large corporations, and finally, why not, to middle-sized companies to behave as in kindergarten. <laughs> Everybody knows there's a big nurse in the background and they will not permit any major failure that might threaten not only an industry, but because the industry is tied up with the financial system, threaten the meltdown of the entire financial system. So this is a very strong uh, perversion of the principle of responsibility. People make bad investment decisions for such a reason. The Austrian business cycle theory explains to us that if the Federal Reserve uh, uses its power to diminish, artificially diminish the interest rates, and then this might entail a business cycle. It might entail intertemporal disequilibria. And this is something, a subject that you have heard this week. But there's also an another mechanism that I should uh, stress. There's a very strong mechanism that pushes the e entire economy into ever greater leverage. And that is because the Fed's have the mission to stabilize the markets. That's what they do. And in Europe, we have it even enshrined in our monetary constitution. The mission of the euro system is to stabilize the monetary system, most notably stabilize the purchasing power of money, that is, stabilize the price level. But it's only a small step from here to the stabilization of all financial assets. Because if you want to stabilize the price level, you have to stabilize those who produce money. That is, you have to stabilize the banks. You cannot do without. You cannot reach your main goal, stabilization of the price level, without making sure that the banking system does not collapse. Because the greatest chunk of the money supply is actually produced not by the central bank, but by the commercial banks. So you have to stabilize the banking system. If you want to stabilize the banking system, the most convenient way to do this is to stabilize the value of their assets. What are the assets that you find on, on the balance sheet of banks? Essentially financial assets. Bonds, also some stocks, and so on. So you need to make sure that there is no major dip major systematic dip on the financial markets. And that is exactly what is happening, what has been going on in the past 30 or 40 years. In the United States, you have a charming uh, institution that is called the Plunge Protection Team. <laughs> Look it up on, on Google. It's not advertised a lot, but it's, uh, so it's, it's a working group composed of uh, Federal Reserve representatives, uh, Treasury representatives, and representatives of major Wall Street firms, the mission of which is to take all measures necessary to prevent a major meltdown of financial titles. Because such a meltdown would have an immediate impact on the balance sheet of our banks, 
which, because banks are highly leveraged, would entail massive bankruptcy at once. Now again, you find the same theme as from the story of debasement. What seems to be beneficial at first is ultimately, of course, very detrimental to the operation of a market economy. Because if banks know that there is a plunge protection team, there is the big nurse in the background that prevents a meltdown of our financial assets, then they have an even stronger incentive to reduce their equity, that is, to go into more debt. The only reason why a company holds a lot of equity is to protect itself against fluctuations of the value of its investments. If a company were only going after profit, after a high return on its own money, then you go into as much debt as possible. You take just, whatever, 1% of equity and 99% of debt. Because whatever return you make, then, even after paying uh, your debt service, is all on the 1%. Right? Let's say you own, uh, you have invested 100 uh, units of money, 100 million dollars, you have earned 10 million dollars, this is all on your own money, so you have earned a 10% return on your own money. If only 1% is your own money, and 99% is debt, and you pay 5% interest on the debt, right? Uh, let's say you pay five, five million dollars interest, so, from the 10 million earnings, so you reduce 5 million in interest, 5 million are left. But these 5 million are now the return on 1 million of your own money. So you have a 500% return on equity. So in other words, if you are just going for a return on equity, you go into as much debt as possible. The only reason why you hold equity is to protect yourself against fluctuations of the value of your assets. There's uncertainty in the market. Therefore, typical firms that do not operate in close cooperation with the, with the central banks, they hold a lot of equity. Small and medium-sized companies are very often in no debt at all. You still have companies that, entrepreneurs that just do not want any debt. And those who do take debt, well, they have whatever, 40% of debt, 60% equity. Oh, let's say 50% is maybe an average. Large corporations, so here already we are in closer contact with the monetary system, they operate with 25, 30% equity. And it's only on the financial markets that we observe absurd equity ratios of 3%, 2% in the case of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, 1% in the case of the German semi-public investment banks, and so the closer they are to government, the lower is the equity ratio. Now, all of this, again, right, is, of course, perfectly rational from the point of view of the individual firm, but highly detrimental from the point of view of the system as a whole. The system as a whole grows much more fragile. So immaterial paper money, therefore, has not... is not the end point of the evolution of our monetary and economic history, right? it's not the high point at which we have finally reached the perfection and come close to 100% efficiency. It has brought us in a highly fragile and dangerous situation. And there are only so many ways out. One way out is the deflationary collapse scenario. Right? Of course, this is very brutal. And I, I wouldn't look forward to this with great joy, but I mean, we should also not neglect, as I've explained in my lecture on Thursday, we shouldn't neglect the advantages of such a scenario. The others, what are the other solutions? Well, the other solutions are more of the same. Right? So you get more, more inflation, more redistribution, that is expropriation of the common man to the benefit of the, of the elites, greater, even greater fragility of the financial system, and ultimately a tyranny. The third solution is hyperinflation, which is kind of a solution, but also entails a complete collapse of the monetary system. So, to conclude, therefore, um, the major institutional transformations that we can observe empirically in the history of monetary systems
are not, from my point, not at all, not at all, the consequence of their greater efficiency from an overall point of view. But they are essentially the result of the fact that these transformations were in the interest of government finance. They promoted government finance as compared to the, exist, uh, the institutions that pre-existed them. So they've great, bought us a greater inflationary potential, greater uh, facility of inflationary finance, but therefore also greater potential to expropriate the population to the benefit of the government and its allies. They have brought us greater fragility of the, of the economy, therefore greater pretext for governments to intervene even further right, and regulate the allegedly uh, instable, fragile markets right, where all the other people behave irrationally and so on. The way out goes by only three major hypotheses, two of which, uh, all three of which are, are terrible, so deflationary meltdown, hyperinflation, complete socialization. Complete socialization is probably the, the worst because you, you choke the division of labor. And this is something that will create mass starvation on a planetary scale, not first uh, in, in the Western countries, but ultimately also in the Western countries. The second worst is uh, inflationary, uh, is the hyperinflation, because it leads to a complete monetary collapse, but also in its process privileges those who benefit from the system right now, and there's more uh, redistribution in favor of the elites. And the third scenario is terrible, it's a deflationary meltdown, but there are two great advantages, well, it dis destroys debt, and it hits the bad guys first. <laughs> With this happy note, I am happy to conclude my, my lecture. <laughs> one, one minute for questions. Okay, yeah. What's your comment on Robert Mundell, who said that uh, democracy makes um, monetary soundness impossible? Yeah, I mean, there, there, there is, of course, a good case to be made for, uh, for this. I mean, as Hans uh, Hermann Hoppe has explained, right, we have these perverse incentives in a, in a dem democratic system, right? There's a, a competition for ever greater expansion of uh, government power, so which may pass through um, uh, an inflationary monetary policy. Yeah, so un unfortunately, there is this tendency. I wouldn't say impossible, and it's not logically possible, but there is this additional tendency, right? Micron? Micron, micron, A bank run. Yeah. Mm -hmm. how, is, how is a deflationary collapse possible? Straightforward deflationary collapse possible? possible? Oh, you mean while we have uh, central banks with immaterial money? For, yeah, of, yeah, of course. They can prevent it at any point of time. And that's, that's my point. Of it. This, therefore, I also said on Thursday, it's not likely that we will observe this. But of course, central banks could theoretically stand, bank, stand back and let everybody else go down the drain. Right? Okay, thank you.